Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second in our, our series of Working From Home webinars. And thank you for joining. Um, I'm, I am uh, Richard Rodriguez, uh, a newcomer to uh, Onset Computer Corp. I am the uh, product marketing manager for outdoor and environmental um, environmental and agricultural products, actually. And then I also have uh, Jessica on the line to help handle any technical questions related to the webinar you may have. So if you have any trouble um, with audio uh, or video, please uh, enter your questions uh, and uh, she'll be able to, to help. Uh, Onset's been manufacturing sensors and data loggers in Cape Cod, Massachusetts since uh, 1981. Uh, we're well known and trusted for reliability and durability. Our products are used to monitor environmental conditions all over the world and are trusted to endure harsh conditions and provide reliable data when needed. So we're trusted in those situations where, when you just need to be sure that your data will, will be there and be good. <clears throat> We've, uh, in talking with uh, several of our agricultural customers, we, we see or note different patterns or uh, common um, challenges uh, shared. Um, challenges in agricultural uh, agricultural type applications that our customers tell us about uh, of course climate um, you know whether it be excess uh, heat or cold um, water um, leading to pests environmental regulations we know those are are always changing especially now with uh, water scarcity um, spraying uh, rules around uh, use of uh, pesticides and different chemicals changing consumer pref preferences. You know, there's uh, been a shift in um, consumer preferences for uh, products that uh, that have less of an environmental impact or uh, have less exposure to different chemicals and availability of labor, which we know now is actually a very much a rising issue with uh, borders being closed. So what is a field monitoring system and why should you care? basically a system of tools with both hardware and software components, um, perhaps. Uh, and actually, I forgot to mention, uh, like many of you, I am working from home uh, with uh, daycares and schools being closed. You may have uh, other audience members in the form of uh, four-year-old girls voices in the background. Um, so I apologize for that in advance. So getting back to uh, our field monitoring systems. So basically, these are systems of tools with both hardware and software components and perhaps uh, remote uh, communications capabilities that enable us to monitor the environmental conditions in a field. So for farmers, this is the ability uh, for, to monitor microclimate conditions on your farm and understand how conditions change from point to point. It's the ability to know uh, what your crops are experiencing on your farm based on direct measurement of those uh, locations, not based on weather data from an airport that may be 20 or 30 miles away. So why, why do this? Well, time and money. So they can save you these systems, these capabilities can save you both time and money, um, <clears throat> which of course, uh, in the end, uh, improves your bottom line. Benefits of a uh, wireless sensor network. Uh, the right field monitoring system can help you reduce costs associated with irrigation by allowing you to water only when uh, only based on a plant demand. Uh, so be, again, by direct measurement of uh, water that is available to, to your plants uh, rather than on a set schedule. It can protect crops and workers from excess um, heat or frost. Uh, where we have real-time alerts uh, that will let you know when there is risk of frost or excess heat, um, so you know to take action uh, at that moment, uh, helping you determine when environmental conditions create high risk for pests, whether they be diseases or insects, and when the peak window to treat um, to treat that condition is most effective. So instead of uh, uh, just having to spray two or three times, maybe uh, we can tell you exactly, help you determine when to, uh, when to apply that. Um, alternatively, you can avoid applying pesticides if conditions don't warrant their application. So again, you're saving time and money there. Avoid, uh, probably more importantly, avoid spraying when conditions are not suitable. So avoid wasting sprays or damaging your neighbor's crops because uh, the wind, wind speeds may be too high. 
help you record uh, historical environmental uh, data and activity uh, for compliance and claims. So maybe perhaps you want to record uh, the wind conditions while you're spraying or uh, uh, for your water usage, uh, maybe record conditions that led to a crop loss uh, to help you file insurance claims after uh, you know too much rain led to uh, a delayed harvest or delayed uh, planting. Ability to monitor multiple points quickly, uh, crop planning, which we'll get into in, in more detail, uh, and easily monitor your fields with less people because all the information comes to you. You can see that anywhere. For any uh, growers in the US, uh, we actually uh, do integrate with third party tools uh, that are available um, that include um, pa specific pest and crop models. Uh, such uh, such as NUA and the Network for Environmental and Weather Applications uh, by Cornell University and FON uh, down in Florida, so the Florida uh, Automated Weather Network. Uh, these networks uh, are sponsored by universities and they offer tools for irrigation planning along with uh, crop models that use weather data to determine where a crop may be within its development cycle. Uh, they give you pest models, um, that, uh, that are based on environmental conditions at the microclimate level. Um, your local network may provide you a view on the risk level uh, for different pests, insects, and diseases, along with recommendations on how to mitigate those or, or treat those. The advantage of using these tools is that uh, you can take a more targeted approach to pest management and ir irrigation. So uh, thus helping you uh, limit the amount of water or pesticides that you have to apply. Uh, some of these networks, such as Fawn and NUA, um, allow you to upload, and that's part of the integration that I'm speaking to, you can actually up upload uh, data from your farm uh, onto their network and use their model specifically to the conditions on your field. So again, instead of relying on conditions at, an, at a location a few miles away, you know specifically based on temperature, humidity, and rain levels on your farm, uh, what, do you, what do you have to be concerned with? Um, looking at NUA specifically, uh, and just trying to put some numbers uh, into um, context for you, uh, in terms of savings, uh, NUA back in 2017 did a survey of uh, close to 400 users, uh, which found that uh, on average, um, uh, their users were saving 43 over $4,300 from reducing sprays, uh, $33,000 uh, from avoided crop losses. And when you look at it on a per acre average, came out to about uh, 2000, uh, just over $2,000 per acre savings. So uh, really what we're talking about here is uh, integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on uh, long-term prevention of pests and their damage uh, through different techniques or a combination of techniques, uh, such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of practices, and then the use of uh, resistant varieties. And then pesticides are only used after monitoring indicates that they are needed. Um, and that's what basically this, uh, these networks will do. They'll tell you, okay, based on these conditions, you should be applying uh, pesticides now, and this is what you should be uh, doing in order to remove only that target uh, organism. On your screen, you'll see uh, several of the pest uh, forecasts uh, and crop management uh, options that NUA uh, offers you, um, and um, that you, you can easily, again, uh, go on there on the website, uh, select any of these tools, and then apply them to the specific uh, data that your that your um, system would be uploading onto their network. Uh, for any any of you that are located in one of those uh, states in green, uh, this service is actually absolutely free to you. Um, there are 15 states and then uh, those in blue, the affiliate states, uh, there is support for you. Uh, there is, however, a $290 per year uh, fee that is not for us, that is uh, for, for NUA, uh, just to help them uh, provide, provide support. Um, 
in terms of cost for uh, a system, so the, there are a, a couple different manufacturers that give you options, us being one of them, um, and a system that gives you all the tools necessary for you to integrate with NUA uh, starts at, uh, at just under $1,900. So when you look at the cost of the system compared to the potential savings, you're looking at, um, at a payback that is that falls under a year. Now, getting into specific other applications, I uh, mentioned uh, crop loss. So uh, one of the, the main values that, that drives um, folks uh, to buying products from us is the need for frost alarms. So we are in the Northeast of the, the United States where, where frost is uh, a big concern. Uh, cold temperatures at the wrong time of the year can mean bad news for growers and their crops. Um, frost risk is highest for early blooms, uh, which you know happen to represent the best and most lucrative part of cr crops for uh, in terms of berry crops. Uh, for example, prices uh, are highest early in the year or very early in the season. Alternatively, for late harvest fruits, such as cranberries and apples, uh, late fall frost can also disrupt an entire harvest. Our devices are being used for frost prevention uh, with um, paired up with wind machines in orchards and vineyards, irrigation in cranberry bogs and uh, other berry farms, and uh, protective covers for different vegetables. In terms of tools uh, needed for, uh, for this application, um, you'd basically be looking at, at a network of uh, temperature sensors um, that can provide real-time alerts when temperatures drop below a user-defined threshold for a specific amount of time. So uh, depending on, on the crop, uh, you're, on what the fruit you're growing, you know, um, depending on the time of the year, the hardiness of that fruit will tell you what temperature you want to be, uh, be cautious of reaching. And based on that, you would set a, a temperature limit and um, our system would send you either an email or a text message uh, to alert you to the fact that um, attention may be needed or countermeasures may be needed. Um, for uh, wind machines, so if, you're, uh, if you've got an orchard and you're using a wind machine, you would actually need two temperature points, uh, one at the canopy height um, to measure the temperature that, is, uh, that your fruit is seeing uh, that would actually cause the frost. And then you would need a second temperature point at about 30 feet in height. Um, and this is important to ensure that there is no temperature inversion. So before you actually start the wind machine, you would confirm that the air temperature up above is not lower than uh, the air temperature at the canopy height. And uh, so you, you wouldn't further exacerbate the, the, the crop loss. Uh, when used with irrigation, a single temperature point at the canopy or fruit height uh, is what is needed. Uh, though you would want several points um, uh, in order to account for possible pockets of cold air. So cold air is heavier than warm air and tends to settle. It actually run, it flows like water. Um, so it would flow downhill and settle in any low-lying areas of your farm, uh, probably be um, along any, if you have any walls or long buildings, uh, structures on your farm, uh, cold air can collect there and stay there and uh, actually cause that to be an area where damage, frost damage uh, would prevail. Um, an example of that, great example of that, that I, that I like to use is a uh, cranberry bog. So again, in uh, Massachusetts, we, we do have, especially here in the Cape Cod area, there are a lot of cranberry bogs. And if uh, you are familiar with a cranberry bog, um, cranberry bogs typically sit a foot or two below uh, the road level or the level the roads are at. Um, and um, because of that, cold air will settle there and you'll see temperature gradients of about eight to 11 degrees um, between any point on the, on the bog itself and, the, and the, the road, which is you know, running right alongside uh, that cranberry bog. So that, that temperature difference really um, enforces the point uh, of needing to, uh, to measure temperature at, uh, at, the, uh, at the microclimate level for you. Um, the right tools can also help ensure that spraying um, 
of different chemicals or pesticides are done when conditions are, are right. So you can avoid drift, which again leads to waste or affecting undesired targets, whether that be uh, a neighboring farm or having uh, a pesticide carry out and uh, uh, get close to a school or a neighborhood, which would uh, upset some folks. Um, there are two ways in which drift can occur, particle drift and vapor drift. Particle drift occurs when small spray droplets travel uh, long distances because of high winds. Uh, sprays end up in your neighbor's farm instead of on your farm, which will upset them perhaps, and uh, basically mean waste on your, on your part. Uh, to avoid this, uh, the recommendations, um, I think nationally are to spray uh, during low wind speeds uh, between three and eight miles per hour or 3.8 kilometers to, uh, per hour to 12.8 kilometers per hour. Uh, wind speeds below that uh, that range actually may indicate temperature inversion, which I'll cover in a minute. Wind speeds higher than uh, eight miles per hour, or that uh, 12 to 13 kilometers per hour, uh, can carry these spray droplets far beyond uh, your buffer zone. Uh, vapor drift, uh, on the other hand, occurs when uh, products volatilize or evaporate and move off the target site. Typically, product these products would volatilize at uh, temperatures in the upper 80s and 90s um, and Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius. The potential for vapor drift is also increased with low uh, relative humidity. Uh, temperature inversions occur when warm air, uh, which is lighter than cold air, rises into the atmosphere while cold air settles close to the ground. Uh, this stops air from mixing. Um, uh, so because the, the inversion acts as a cap on the upward movement of air from the lower layers. Uh, so during a temperature inversion, there is no mixing of air, which causes spray droplets to not spread. Instead, these droplets kind of remain and look like a cloud hovering up or floating above uh, your crop and don't actually settle on the crop. And they just float there like a cloud. And any slight breeze can blow those off of your farm and uh, again, off off site. Uh, wind speeds under three miles per hour may indicate be indicative of uh, temperature inversion. It's interesting, just a couple months ago, I was talking um, uh, to a, my colleague down in Brazil, and he was talking to um, a rancher that owns a lot of land. I believe he was growing uh, sugar cane. And after talking about this, um, that, that landowner said, you know, he could have saved um, over it was uh, between ten and twenty thousand dollars of worth of spray that was just wasted because he sprayed had a temperature inversion and uh, basically all that just uh, uh, didn't settle as as planned. Um, tools needed for that uh, for this application uh, would basically be a wind speed and direction um, sensor uh, where you would set alerts prior to spraying so that um, you can record look uh, and confirm that wind speeds are okay prior to spring and then you would have the alert uh, hit you uh, shoot you a text message in the event uh, that while you're spraying those that temperature speed would uh, would increase uh, so that you could you could uh, stop um, the activity uh, temperature points uh, canopy height um, uh, or the the height of your spray boom uh, would be needed uh, to confirm that to just confirm that your the temperatures aren't so high that you risk volatilizing uh, your your sprays, and then you would want also a relative humidity sensor just to confirm that uh, the air is not overly dry. So a moisture sensors can help you determine when your crops need water and improve irrigation planning by looking at how moisture levels change over time on how quickly they change at specific points in your, in your on your farm. Soil moisture data can be viewed for planning uh, or estimating when you'll next have to water your crops. So perhaps you want to spray uh, and you need to verify that you'll be able to hold off on watering for long enough to not dilute the spray uh, application. Um, so this will help you determine that. Uh, soil moisture thresholds can also be set so that you can uh, get an alert notification uh, by phone or email uh, when when you need to uh, begin planning ir irrigation. In terms of soil moisture sensors, there, there are quite, um, several different options. 
Uh, we, we actually offer quite a wide range. Um, two types of soil moisture measurement available. Um, though the main two types are volumetric soil moisture content, uh, which measures the amount of water in the soil as a percentage or, or cubic meters over cubic meter uh, of water over cubic meters of soil. Uh, soil water potential or tension uh, measures the stress level of a plant or how much attention that plant needs to apply in order to uh, pull water from the soil. Volumetric soil moisture sensors provide an accurate low cost method to measure soil moisture content, but require calibration or uh, uh, change understanding how how those uh, how that data would change from soil type to soil type. Um, salinity can also of the soil can also impact that reading or meaning as uh, your type of soil changes or salinity increases. Uh, that volume of water that you have may be uh, the same. However, um, it may change how easy it is for a plant to, to absorb that water. Uh, so you may know that as you apply, um, if, if you increase salt or iron content of a, of a soil, uh, it, it may be more difficult for water to absorb, uh, for plants to absorb the water uh, that is in the soil. Volumetric soil moisture sensors may also offer temperature and electrical conductivity measurements. Uh, the electrical conductivity measurements may help uh, mitigate the influence of salinity or compensate for the influence of the salinity in your soil moisture measurements. Uh, because soil water potential sensors provide a view of crop stress or how much how, how hard it is for, for plants to absorb water, they're often preferred in agriculture. Um, because these measure, the measurements are for tension and not for water content, factors such as the soil type and salinity aren't factored into your results. All you're seeing is how hard is it for your plants or your crop to take water in from the soil. So looking at the table on the right, you'll see how vo uh, volumetric water content readings uh, for different soil types are different um, for the same amount of tension or, or, or pressure required by a, a plant to absorb water. Um, you look at clay, clay holds on to more water um, or retains water for longer. However, it is more difficult for a plant to pull water from a clay type soil. Also related to irrigation, we do offer uh, water level, remote water level, le ah, sorry. Uh, we offer remote water level monitoring solutions. So you can also uh, uh, monitor your water level in wells, tanks and reservoirs remotely. Actually, I have an example of a, a local customer that owns um, a winery in Portugal. Um, so he's quite far from, from uh, his land. He's got a, few, a couple of full-time employees working there. He's got uh, 22,000 vines, um, but he is located in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so as a, uh, rather than continue to um, have to have someone look at the uh, grape, the leaves to determine when, when irrigation may be needed. He can now monitor uh, soil moisture uh, conditions remotely and make a phone call uh, to plan, uh, plan out um, irrigation. Uh, that Northern Portugal is quite arid in the summer. Uh, he's got two wells on the property. So he is able to monitor um, between monitoring irrigation and water level you know, he can be careful not to run, run wells dry. Another common application uh, we come across is crop planning, uh, or uh, prior to having crops in place, uh, having someone determine, uh, understand what the conditions will be, how much time, um, uh, or how many, determining how many grow, growing degree days we'll be seeing, how, how much frost exposure will be, Will there be in a specific location so that you can then choose or select the right uh, crops uh, for a specific part of, of a farm? Um, yeah, I, I actually came across a, a customer uh, just a few weeks ago in California looking to grow um, th that are currently growing citrus, but they were interested in knowing if they could grow finger limes um, and uh, on part of a farm. Uh, so the recommendation there is to deploy uh, several temperature sensors um, 
in different uh, sections of the farm uh, to uh, understand how temperatures fluctuate, uh, know if they uh, find different parts where uh, temperatures may not uh, dip uh, below a certain threshold, which would allow them to, to then choose that section of, of the orchard to then grow these finger limes. Uh, some growers deploy our instruments, um, uh, again, before, before knowing what to grow on the farm. So then they'll, they'll create a map like you see there on, your, on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and they'll, they'll leave these out for a year or two uh, prior to actually selecting their crops. Um, and they tend to find that depending, based on elevation changes, they can see eight to 11 degree uh, differences from a high elevation to low elevation. And for an application such as this, you'd probably uh, be looking for, depending on, on what you're trying to determine, uh, you may um, be okay with uh, only deploying uh, temperature sensors. You may also be interested in uh, understanding how sun exposure changes. So a, uh, a solar radiation sensor uh, may, be, may also be of interest in uh, each different location. So before we get into the factors to consider um, uh, when choosing, when selecting a wireless sensor network, um, I want to talk about uh, the difference between a single station versus a sensor network. If your farm resembles, you know, the farm up on the on the top there and got a plain landscape with no change in elevation, uh, this tends to be easier to monitor, requires uh, less points of measurement. Um, you know, conditions such as temperature and wind, sunlight, won't change much from location to location. So assuming the soil type is also consistent, you can probably or most likely get away with just having a weather station in one location. Uh, maybe um, uh, you would only need wireless sensors uh, if you're also looking for soil moisture. If on the other hand, your farm, your uh, land uh, ch has changes in elevation, different slopes uh, with uh, meaning different um, exposure to sunlight, um, changes in soil type, uh, you'll likely be better served with a wireless sensor network, which would basically be a, a weather station with the capability of having um, wireless sensors to, to, to uh, co uh, measure specific items at different locations. So now getting into the factors to consider. So first factor to consider is ease of deployment. We, none of us really want to spend too much time trying to decipher um, how to uh, configure an item. Um, so the, you know, one, per, uh, one of the questions to ask is uh, methods using for connection. So you, know, you want a wireless sensor network. Uh, how do I set it up? How do I go about connecting the wireless sensors to my system? Uh, there are different ways to do it. Likely the easiest uh, way is a push push of a button, much like pairing devices uh, with a router or a Bluetooth item at home um, by pushing a device, uh, a button on each device, um, get the, put those uh, sensors into pair mode and uh, they basically configure themselves. Um, there are um, options with, that would require you to download a, an app for a mobile device and go through your configuration that way. Uh, there are dip switches, uh, which uh, where you would select or position dip switches, uh, somewhat like pairing, uh, setting up a garage door opener. Um, and then there are other uh, sensor networks that were, require programming, um, and uh, uh, where that may that may be more uh, may provide you more uh, flexibility, but would uh, uh, definitely require much more time and knowledge on uh, how to uh, set up. Uh, these sensors. Mounting, uh, how, how difficult will it be to, to carry these out into the field and mount them? So uh, you're looking for factors such as size and weight, um, power source, uh, do they require um, to be, are they required to be plugged into power? Do they run off a battery uh, or do they uh, have uh, an option for solar, solar power? Uh, do they offer integrated mounting provisions or will you have to be cre get creative with how to mount them? And uh, is security a concern? 
a major, another major fact to consider is software or the user interface. Uh, you'll want to gauge how easy and intuitive it is to configure um, and then use. Uh, what type of information does it display? And does it allow you to set up um, your own dashboards to show information that's most relevant to you? Uh, can you share that data with others? How easy is it to access the data? Can you see, uh, look at it from anywhere on the go? Or do you have to be um, get to one central location? Um, and then uh, different systems allow you uh, different uh, methods to share data, um, whether it be just viewing data or export, exporting that data um, so that you can then manipulate it or analyze it in other systems. The wireless sensor coverage. Again, we're, we're talking about um, wireless sensor networks. So you'll want to understand uh, what kind of wireless frequency is used, uh, mostly to understand how that may impact you. Is it a signal that allows you um, a farther mounting distance or uh, is it a frequency that's better suited for um, uh, limiting attenuation in on a farm where you, know, you expect that the signal must propagate through vegetation and some some barriers, so you, you may need uh, to find uh, an option that gives you the, the power uh, to, to get through those obstructions. Uh, one good way to compare um, range is line of sight. Of course, this is a, a number uh, that means you know, no obstructions, nothing in between the two, the two devices, uh, but it, it is a, a common point of comparison. And wireless sen uh, sensor um, coverage type, um, star networks versus mesh networks. So if you look at a star network, it basically um, would have a central station uh, which communicates information to the internet. Um, and then all sensors around it must connect directly uh, to that central station. This limits the range of your sensor network to the radius around that central station, depending on on the maximum communication distance. With a mesh network, uh, on the other hand, you can, uh, the sensors can communicate through each other and get to get back to that central station. The advantage here is that because you can relay information from one sensor to the other, you can extend your network of sensors out much farther than you would otherwise, um, which really increases the coverage of a single, of a single uh, central station. Uh, you have the option for using, um, so in, in a system such as what we offer, you have the option of using sensors as repeaters uh, to transfer information from one sensor to the next and then to finally to, the, to that central station. Or you can use a network extender to repeat this information. Um, the maximum number of hops permitted determine, determines the maximum number of devices possible between uh, the furthest uh, uh, out from the central station. So as an example, in our, in our case, uh, each sensor gives you a range of 1,500 to 2,000 feet line of sight from device to, de to device uh, because we, offer, we allow for uh, a maximum number of five hops. You can get up, reach a, a range from the central station to the furthest up point of somewhere between 7,500 to 10,000 feet. Actionable information. Uh, what kind of information can you get? How easy is it to look at? Um, you know, do, does it, is there a dashboard that you can configure to show you the most critical information so that you can uh, plan your day before getting started? Um, do, does the software integ provide integrated uh, pest and crop models? And uh, does it, uh, is there any form of integration with the crop management networks or other software tools? Uh, again, uh, you know some examples out there. You know, in North America, there are there are a handful of them, two of which we can uh, we can help you connect to. Alarm notifications, um, if needed, uh, does the system provide you the ability to set up uh, or configure uh, alarms and get those get those alarms on the go? Can you uh, can you set up different levels? I know we we have customers that that don't just want to get one alert when they absolutely need to act. Uh, perhaps in the in the 
case of uh, frost prevention, they want to be able to get an alert when temperature reaches, say, 32 degrees so that they wake up and um, can, can look at the, the rate of change in temperature uh, so that they can start to estimate whether or not an action will be needed. Um, and, and then they'll get a second alarm when the temperature reaches, say, 28 degrees, so four degrees lower, uh, so that the farmer can, uh, can actually go out and, uh, and take action. And then um, are these alert, do these alarms take place at the station versus web-based? Uh, and the difference there just being uh, this, the reliability of getting that alert. So if uh, the device itself takes a, a measurement uh, and then provides you that alert, um, you don't need to wait for a connection to the internet in order for that connection, uh, that alarm to, uh, to be triggered. And then um, do you need to be able to turn something on or off uh, with that? So perhaps when you get the um, get that alarm uh, for frost, you want to uh, start your initiate a pump uh, to uh, start up the irrigation system to protect your crop. Uh, and uh, you'd want to know whether or not that that uh, sensor network has the capability of doing that for you. Maintenance of historical data. Uh, you want to understand how long data is stored, uh, what is the cost of storing their da this data, and then uh, how easy is it for you to uh, get that, that data. Uh, scalability. Um, as your farm grows or your, your comfort or interest in um, monitoring um, what these sensors can monitor. You may want to uh, add additional devices at, uh, over time. Uh, so you want to understand whether you have that option, what will the max range or number of sensors be, and then uh, how, you know, overall, what, is, what would the cost be to, to scale that? Uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, of course, you'll, you'll have your initial cost. You'll want to know how much, uh, what that, that first cost up front would be. Uh, you'll want to understand what type of annual fees or other recurring costs there may be, uh, whether they are, are maintenance costs, uh, future expansion costs. Again, if you decide that you want to expand the size of your network, um, that's uh, you want to know whether uh, there would be any additional costs associated with that. Determine if local grants or subsidies are available. I know uh, there are, we often come across different um, um, initiatives that, that that do provide uh, different grants, whether they be associated with irrigation efficiency to help uh, local farmers reduce water usage or uh, different um, uh, integrated pest management uh, initiatives at the state or level or uh, uh, you know crop specific. Uh, we do ha uh, come across several of those. Uh, so if you're if you're not aware of any, you may want to reach out to local organizations that you may be a part of and ask that. You can all, always also reach out to us and see if we're aware of any um, uh, in, your, in your state. Um, and then time horizon, how long will the product uh, be deployed and, uh, and impact uh, your activities and decisions? And finally, uh, who owns your data? Is your data for your use only? or is uh, data used by a third party. I know there are, I have come across some of uh, typically newer, newer startups uh, that, that provide you products at a lower cost, but then use your data uh, to supplement their, their income. Um, and uh, you know, whether they're selling that data, providing that data to another third party, or then they're then using that data to create other types of value for them. Uh, so that, that may be a, a point of interest to you. So you'll want to consider that. Uh, and uh, with that, I conclude uh, my presentation. Um, I'll be open to any questions you may have. All right, let's see here. Flow meters for pressurized pipes. Uh, so not quite sure, completely sure what uh, you're looking, you may need here, but uh, we offer solutions for monitoring flow in pipes um, with options for uh, monitoring flow and pressure. Uh, so the, really I, we would need to understand uh, what, specific, what exactly you're trying to accomplish. Um, so we, we 
rather than try to guess at the answer, I'd like to uh, understand uh, what your specific need is there. So I can I can follow up after the call, or you know, feel free to reach out to one of our uh, application specialists, and we'll uh, we'll be able to provide you some some options. How do you handle data security from sensors to data hub and hub to cloud? Uh, so, um, so each wireless sensor has a data logger attached capable of storing data for, for months if, in the event that connection um, to the station is interrupted. Uh, the station itself is also a data logger capable of storing data for extended peri periods of time for the entire network in the event that the internet connection is lost or interrupted. In terms of like uh, data security itself, uh, you know, I can refer you to our customer support team uh, for information on uh, getting a document outlining uh, more details on, on security. How is the system powered? Are there options? Uh, uh, yes, so our remote monitoring stations are solar powered. We also have an AC powered option and typically used for indoor growing operations, uh, actually indoor operations in general. Uh, we do have a, quite a, a broad uh, indoor um, monitoring business as well. Uh, we also offer a battery powered option. Uh, the case is a fruit in Latin America. Uh, we have uh, we do we actually have several success stories uh, throughout Latin America. We've uh, we've focused on on growing there over the past uh, couple of years. I would be happy to connect with you directly uh, to understand uh, what you'd be looking for, or connect you with our sales manager for Latin America uh, to discuss specific examples and applications. Uh, see if there's anything that we can uh, uh, maybe able to help you with. It is is it possible to integrate the network? And the network third-party sensors that are not available in your catalog. Yes, uh, de that depends on the sensors uh, or the the, um, the type of sensor. So we do offer uh, an option to connect um, third-party sensors uh, with uh, uh, the four to twenty milliamp um, output uh, with our our RX three thousand station. So we do offer. Uh, the option to to add a module that will allow you to wire in uh, these third-party sensors. And sensor network placement across complex topography. Are remote sensor signals directional? So they're um, not directional per se. They 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 do propagate a signal all around, uh, so 360 degrees around. But it is uh, uh, kind of like a flat like a donut, not a sphere. Uh, though the signal is strongest directly out through the front of the, the radio and the back of the radio. So it'll go in, in both directions. Um, and then again, each sensor in our case acts as a relay uh, so that if you have tough terrain, um, you can add a, either a network extender or another sensor to help uh, get a signal either around difficult terrain or an obstruction or, or uh, somehow bridge the gap there. Um, like uh, I sh in that, that uh, example that took place in Portugal, the terrain there was quite uh, quite harsh. Um, the change in elevation was was rather large, uh, more than what we typically find around here. Um, and we were able to, uh, to cover, uh, get a really good coverage from top to bottom there. Uh, how many soil potential sensors should I install in order to capture the overall water conditions in an orchard? Um, so that really, there are several factors that you want to account. I, I can't just give you a number. Um, uh, it really, it, it depends on changes in elevation and, cha and changes in soil type. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, soil type. So. Um, it, depending it, water because water flows downhill, of course, you may have uh, different sections that will retain water differently uh, or capture more water, and you'll want to understand that. So 
if you know that you have areas where you've got higher moisture and lower, lower moisture, you'll want to have sensors for each of those locations so that you can know you may, you may not need to uh, uh, water your entire property, but focus on a specific location. Uh, similarly, if you've got changes in soil type, uh, again, soil type will will pull will hold on to water uh, differently, require different uh, or put, place different stress on your on your uh, trees, uh, and so you'll want to also uh, account for that. Um, but you know that's something that I would recommend. Uh, we, you get in touch with us so that we can work through that with you and create an estimate for uh, what a, a good starting point would be for you. And then there were, uh, for, in the case of orchards, you may want to also install um, uh, some sensors at different depths uh, to, to understand how uh, water um, changes or moisture changes throughout the root depth. So I still have a little over 10 minutes, uh, so I can take a few more questions. Um, are your stations compatible with uh, volumetric water content profile probes such as Centec instead of Thekagon sensors? Um, so yeah, uh, we have, again, we have the capability of um, connecting um, uh, devices with uh, uh, an analog output. Uh, Centec, I believe is uh, um, a CI-12. Uh, we do have uh, a few new uh, soil moisture sensors getting uh, becoming available in the next week. Um, uh, so actually, uh, so you know, stay tuned. We'll be, we'll, we'll, uh, you will may be getting an invitation to join another webinar from us uh, in the in the next uh, upcoming days. Are your stations okay? Got that. How do you set the altitude correction for barometric pressure? I'm not sorry, I'm not sure I understand that. I'll um, have to get back to connect with you directly to under, uh, make sure I, I get that question. For irrigation, uh, do you recommend the number of sensor nodes uh, should be installed in a field? Again, uh, and, and Regarding the, the number of sensors uh, for soil moisture that you would need, uh, we, it, it's a conversation, a collaboration. Um, we need to understand uh, what type of, uh, you know, what you're seeing in your in your farm in terms of elevations, uh, soil types, and, and all that. Uh, so that that can be, you know, we can help you um, get an idea of uh, a good number to start with um, by by working through that with you. And, and then uh, again, you can always uh, start off uh, small and, um, and as you find that there are other uh, variables that you want to account for, you can always add additional sensors. What is the scale of your networks? How many devices in a single mesh? Uh, so our stations um, for wireless sensors allow you to connect up to 50 wireless sensors. And again, that is uh, with a maximum number of uh, five hops. Um, and then uh, we have a station that allows you to wire an additional 10 directly into the station um, and uh, a lower cost version that, that uh, also allows that 50 wireless sensors uh, with an additional five um, wired in directly. Uh, can your sister log to a third party? We do. Uh, we do partner with uh, several different third parties. Uh, not Earth Cube. Um, can Onset provide complete forecast model packages such as Apple uh, Alert a package or others? We do. We do not have. We do not provide the disease models. Um, you, we believe that these are these, there are a lot of models that are specific to to different crops and uh, specific geographically. Uh, so again, we we do partner with uh, different organizations that that provide those. Uh, so we, we basically provide you the tools to get the data, 
and share that data with those networks and then get that um, um, uh, use their take advantage of those models that are are um, specific to uh, to that region. Uh, does the wireless sensor network support automatic irrigation? We do have um, some customers that that do that that um, uh, to, perhaps control wire. Uh, we have the option to, to add a relay um, on a uh, on a station uh, and where you get an alert and that triggers an action uh, which could can, may be a pump, uh, but it is uh, I'll admit it, it is. Um, uh, limited to that, not uh, not where you could open up an app on your phone and uh, click go. And uh, with that, it seems like that is it for questions. Well, again, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, this uh, webinar uh, was recorded and it will be available to watch at any other time um, on our website. Thank you again, and I uh, hope everyone uh, is hanging in there and staying safe during these uh, uh, interesting times.